Okay, so we've now extracted, or we're about to extract the RNA from the samples that we've carefully managed based on a previous slide. I do recommend a kit-based method to extract RNA samples, and of course, I recommend BioLab products. Uh, we do have excellent solutions, and uh, typically, uh, I have had no issues with any of my own customers that have used our own RNA extraction kits uh, to extract their RNA. Just bear in mind that using a kit such as the ORM kit allows you to use not verified standardized protocols with reagents that are sure to be RNAs free, which is very important when you're extracting RNA under very strictly controlled conditions to assure in the end that you get a very good, pure, and high quality RNA sample, which is really what you're looking for. The whole basis of your experiments is based on extracting a very nice RNA sample to be able to do the reverse transcription on. Once we've extracted the RNA sample, we need to make sure that it is free of protein and should be undegraded. If you've used a kit-based method, the points in black will all be looked after by the kit, typically particularly with the worm kits. But what won't be looked after is, and what needs to be measured, is the purity of your sample with respect to protein contamination to assure that your sample is free of protein, and the quality of your sample with respect to degradation to be sure that your RNA is intact. It's very important for doing qPCR. If your sample is not pure uh, or free of protein, that can actually affect the reverse transcription reaction, leading to variable amounts of cDNA or variable, or variably transcribed uh, cDNA, which can then cause problems in your uh, in your biological variability between different samples that have been reverse transcribed. As far as the degradation process goes, very important again because degraded RNA will cause um, can cause gross changes in the in the um, in the qPCR experiment, again causing uh, very large um, biological variability between different replicates, causing those error bars to just be unmanageable between the experimental and control groups. So to to just emphasize the point, if we look at and why we need to read both purity and quality. If we look at readings that were done in the nanodrop, which is basically a spectral photometer that allows you to read very small volumes of a sample, we see that all of the samples in this experiment, this was basically just a heat degradation experiment of RNA. You can actually heat RNA to 90 degrees, and over time, at 90 degrees, the RNA will degrade. So, but we, we can see here that over the whole duration of the experiment, the RNA levels didn't change very much from beginning to end, and a very, were all perceived to be very pure samples. Pure, a pure sample is typically an uh, OD260 to 280 ratio of 1.8 or greater, and all of these samples were greater than 1.8, as you can see. However, if we look at the virtual gel image from an Experion uh, system which measures the quality of RNA, now you could do this based on, you could do this on an agarose gel as well. So you run your sample on a denaturing agarose gel. What you're looking for is the 28S and the 18S bands uh, on the gel, where such that the 28S band is at least equivalent to the 18S band, uh, and that's for most tissue samples should be greater than the 28S, than the 18S band. So the 28S band should be thicker than the 18S band for cell uh, extractions because cell extractions are just easier to get. They're easier to get at the RNA typically than tissue. What you'll notice is as RNA degrades, and this is the same samples that would run on the nanodrop run on a gel, is that the 28S band gradually decreases until it finally disappears. The 18S band prevails a little bit longer until finally you get a massive degradation on the bottom of the gel. Now, the problem with running a gel with to determine these values of the 28S and 18S ratio is that it requires a minimum of 200 nanograms of RNA uh, to get a decent picture of those bands, up to half a microgram, actually, of, of RNA uh, can be required. 
the nice thing about the Experion system is it allows you to run um, between about half of half a picogram uh, and uh, and up to um, half a microgram. So a very large dynamic range, but you can run very small quantities of your sample um, in comparison to running a gel, um, much less than tenfold uh, of the sample requirements for a gel. The point of the slide being is that if you look at the last say five samples in this experiment, you can see that the RNA that the 20S band is significantly degraded uh, versus the 18S band, um, leading, and the last three samples are particularly degraded. But if you look at the uh, OD260 to any ratios, they're actually very similar. And so even though the sample looks to be pure in terms of the OD260 in terms of protein contamination, it's actually degraded. And the effect of degradation is a shift in your CT values, which is the crux of how you measure qPCR. I'm not going to get into this. I can, I can, uh, I will produce another presentation that will describe what is qPCR in, in a basic sort of a training. But the bottom line is that your biological variability can be huge between intact samples and degraded samples. Between the intact sample here and the degraded sample, the CT shift was about six CTs in this case, which is about a 64-fold perceived expression difference uh, from intact to degraded. In the carcinoma liver sample, between intact and degraded samples, the shift in CTs was 10, which is a thousand-fold approximately uh, perceived expression difference. So if we wouldn't have measured the level of degradation between our samples, this would lead to huge biological variability uh, between, the, between the replicates and basically uninterpretable data. Okay, so once we have extracted our RNA of the kit, we tested it for both purity using the nanodrop or spectral photometer for the OD26280 and the quality using the Experion system or a gel if we have enough RNA to look at the 28S and 18S ratio. Now we're ready to design our primers. So we have our samples. We've done the reverse transcription on those good samples. So we have the cDNA. And with one sample of cDNA, we're going to test our, our primers, which we will have designed based on this slide using primerblast and mfold. So these are two common uh, um, uh, websites, MCBI, everyone knows about MCBI, and on MCBI they've, lo they've launched this year actually a program to design primers, a really fantastic program called Primer Blast. I do recommend that you uh, check it out. And uh, Enfold, you can Google Enfold and you can find the website there. Once you use these two pieces of software to design your primers, choose at least two sets of primers and validate them with a thermal gradient and a standard curve. And you can see here, primer blast, this is a screenshot of Primer Blast on the NCBI website. Very, very simple to use by entering faster GI sequences or accession numbers, and, uh, or just the raw sequence. And you can design your primers very, very simply. And it will give, it will give you back very specific primers because it takes the primer pairs and blasts them against the genome to be sure that they're specific. So the primer pairs that are reported back are, are specific to your gene of interest within the genome that you're looking at. MFOLD, what MFOLD does is it will, you can plug the resulting amplicon sequence from primer blast into MFOLD at the predicted annealing temperature of the primers, and it will show you the propensity for secondary structure hairpin loops and, and these kinds of things in your amplicon at the predicted annealing temperature. So in this case, this is an amplicon. Uh, the same amplicon in both of these pictures here. In the, in the case of the upper picture, this is the amplicon at a 60 degree uh, temperature. And in the lower picture, this is the amplicon at 65. So you can see that at 60 degrees, there's a huge propensity for secondary structure. And essentially, I just wouldn't use the primers uh, under these conditions um, at a 60 degree annealing temperature because those primers will have a very poor efficiency uh, in your qPCR reaction and, again, cause your CT values to shift dramatically uh, vis-a-vis -vis, um, using, using um, 
uh, right out to kind of 65, which has a very low secondary structure, allowing your primers to bind and anneal and, and work through the uh, the.